so Jesus, on his way to the cross, and I, as I said in the prayer, um, the question today is, do you have an attitude of gratitude, Christians? Do you? For what Jesus has done? Are you really watching and waiting in light of what we're seeing in the world events for the Lord's return? Do you sense that the other shoe's about to drop, so to speak? That something big's about to happen? Even the world feels something big's about to happen. Could be World War III. It could be. But you know what? I'm not here as a prophet of doom. I'm here as a, a hope dealer today. And I pray that the hope of Jesus Christ overwhelms you and enlightens you and blesses you and keeps you buoyant through the turbulent sea waters of sin that we find ourselves in the midst of being tossed in to and fro with. That we remain rock steady and keep our eye on the prize of the Lord's return for those who believe. Do you believe today? Are you living as if he could return today? If you are, say amen. amen. So Tuesday we saw Israel killed Hezbollah's top military guy. And then Wednesday, Iran's Hamas leader was taken out, assassinated. We're hearing, like Jesus said before I return, he says, you're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars. I mean, this is on a global scale. This is unlike years before. This is all over. And uh, World War III, you keep hearing that popping up, you know. And I'm here to tell you, we are close to the Lord's return. He's going to put an end to all this and turn things aright. But in the meantime, everything's upside down. The rapture of the church, the catching up of the bride that I keep alluding to, it comes seven years before the second coming of Jesus. So the church goes first. The, the uh, Old Testament saints, the, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And just seconds later, uh, the, those that belong, that are alive and, and remain here, uh, the church, the born again believer, will be caught up with them. And then we are at a marriage supper as the bride, the church, with the bridegroom Jesus for seven years. But all hell breaks loose once the church is gone. Once the prayers are gone, once the righteous people are gone, once those that care, once those that are, depend on prayer are lifted up and out of here, the Holy Spirit goes with them for the most part. And you know what? It's going to be awful hard not to fall into the delusion of the new leader that shows up, fake Jesus, Antichrist, and the world will be under his spell and they'll have their Jesus that they've always wanted, just hand crafted to their de specific details of a sinful lifestyle, he will applaud and a false religion will overtake the world and people will bow to it, no problem. Some will reject it, but judgment comes and that false peace that was short-lived that the Antichrist brings about in the world after the Christians are gone, um, it's going to get real chaotic because the judgment of God will start coming upon unbelieving man while we are having a marriage supper with the Lord in heaven. But at the end of that seven years judgment on earth, and fake Jesus shows his true colors, well, that's when all nations converge upon Israel. They're trying to do it now. They're trying to exterminate Israel now. And I, the time just doesn't permit for today to get into all those details, but they're in the scripture. We've been studying those in detail on our men's group on Friday mornings, and uh, we touch upon those on uh, our Wednesday classes through Revelation, which we're wrapping up this coming week. And I think we're gonna go right into the book of Genesis on Wednesday night where it all began, but we're seeing it all culminate in our Revelation class, but it's culminating here in our lives. Can I get a witness? Amen. And so the question is, the rapture of the church comes seven years before the second coming in the kingdom of God on earth for a thousand years. Are you rapture ready, church? Are you kingdom ready? Because we're going to serve in the kingdom after the rapture for a thousand years with the Lord on earth. And there's not going to be one unbeliever to begin the kingdom. The beginning of the kingdom is no unbelievers whatsoever. I can't even imagine a word like, world like that. And the Lord Jesus will be reigning here on earth in person with us in our glorified state. He's in his glorified state. And yet, a thousand years will pass. And at the end of that thousand years, it kind of history repeats itself. And we'll get into that a little later. But does your lifestyle reflect a readiness for meeting the Lord and kingdom work? And I start with that, I'm gonna end with all that. But in the meantime, Jesus is preparing their hearts. As he's going to the cross, preparing himself to make the sacrifice that's making all this possible for us to be with God in heaven forevermore, 
He says, now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria, a Gentile country in Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village there, met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. Now leprosy in that day, of course, a skin disease. It was a flaky and it could be oozy skin disease. And I know it's Sunday morning and we're getting graphic here, but it's a very uncomfortable, nasty disease. And um, it was painful and you know what, you were ostracized from society. Now, in the law of Moses, there was a prescription of how this was to be dealt with. If you were a leper, you were now ceremonially unclean, unfit to stand and offer sacrifice to the priest on your behalf uh, at this, uh, and, and not the fellowship within the community. You had to get out of town and separate yourself so no one else got leprosy. And there was a procedure that the Old Testament law said of treatment and how you had to be checked by the priest and the sore had to look a certain way before the priest would declare you ceremonially clean once again and you would be restored back into the community fellowship. Until then, you're ostracized, you had to stand afar off. And that's why it says 10 men who were lepers stood afar off. They're off uh, away from everyone. This was an incredible, as far as they were concerned, an incurable disease. They were in, uh, that's the earthly perspective, but God wants to bring them to uh, a hope in his abilities and they needed heavenly intervention and they knew it. I'm sure they tried everything possible to be healed and they were turning to God because they heard all about Jesus and Jesus is walking down the way and they lifted up their voices way, he's, Jesus is way far off, and they're yelling, no doubt, lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Oh boy, do they need mercy. Don't we need mercy? Amen. The mercy of God. And you know what? It's kind of redundant, really, when you think about it as a Christian. Uh, once you start growing and maturing in, in the Word of God, in your walk with God, that Jesus really has no need to give us mercy anymore in the fact that he's given us all the mercy he can give us in his sacrifice on the cross. Because he died for us, he's enabled us to call on him, and all the mercy we'll ever need will be in our relationship we now have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So he's given us all the mercy. It's there for us. It's there for the asking. And so, but they... We're without hope. Have mercy on us, the most natural thing in the world, in light of what they've heard about Jesus healing people and raising people from the dead. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. Jesus did not live above the law that he made. He worked within the law. And obviously these are Jewish men, all but this one who's a Samaritan that we're going to see show up here in a minute. So when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And that takes us back to Leviticus 13 and 14. Um, the priests were responsible for examining the skin and the diseases, whatever they were, to make sure that they had to proclaim they were either clean or unclean, uh, able to be restored into the covenant community and blessings of God, to be made blessable again. Uh, Jesus just wasn't pulling this out of his back pocket. This was the law of God for the Jewish people. Go show yourselves to the priest to be declared clean. And they got to be thinking for a split second, well, well, but we're not clean. We're full of leprosy. But Jesus is yelling at them, head down this way, just about face, go talk to the priest now. Well, they exercised their faith muscles and they did what he said. So it was, it says, as they went, they were cleansed. Now, it's interesting to note that this healing was suddenly. It was immediately. It was out of the blue. It occurred only after they obeyed his command to go show themselves to the priest. They showed faith. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please God. They went and were cleansed. And one of them, here's our Samaritan, when he saw that he was healed. Remember, there's 10 of these guys. But one, wow, I can't believe it. He returned. And with a loud voice, glorified God. And fell down on his face, an act of worship, humbling, and at his feet, giving him thanks. 
And he was a Samaritan. He wasn't one of the chosen people. He wasn't the Jew. Salvation came to the Jew first. He was a half-breed Jew. Part Jew, part Greek. And the, and the Jewish people had an issue with them. They weren't fully Jews. They weren't fully eligible to be part of the covenant blessings of God and all that Moses had promised through the commandments and everything. No, there was a lot of hard feelings, hatred even, with a Samaritan between a Jew. But while they were all in their leprous state, they were all able to get along. They were on an even playing field. We're all suffering with leprosy, Jew and Gentile or Samaritan alike. Do you see the camaraderie? Yeah. Now all of a sudden the, the Jews are just heading on out to the priest. They continue on. Here this Samaritan who already knew he was not in good standing with the Jews is finding himself ever the more so grateful than the Jews and returns back to Jesus. And he's got to be formulating in his mind, in his heart, in his soul. Oh, wow, he's everything he claimed to be. He is Messiah. He healed me. All that I heard about him healing others is true. And he, I'm experiencing that. He was a Samaritan. He came back and glorified the God of Israel. You know, it reminds me of the story of Naaman back in 2 Kings. Naaman had leprosy. And Elisha the prophet said, listen, you want to be healed, you got to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. In and out seven times to be healed of this leprosy. And he could have argued and said, that's stupid, that's foolish, I've never heard of such a thing, I'm not going to do it. He did it, and he came back and glorified the God of Israel, just like our Samaritan man here in our text today. But Jesus sent the lepers to show themselves to the priest. So, no doubt they were Jewish. Well, the others continued on. No doubt they were eager to be declared clean so that they could return to their normal life in society with their friends and family and workplace. They just kept going, forgetting to give thanks. Unfortunately, sometimes we forget to give thanks as God's people, don't we? Something good happens. We've been praying for it to happen, and there's not a thankfulness. There's a, oh, thank God it happened, and you just move on. Was it really God? Oh, maybe it was just coincidence. Maybe it was going to happen anyway. And you kind of have that riding the fence attitude about how this came about. But listen, when you get down to it and understand that all good things come from God. Amen. There's no good that comes out of anything in life, anywhere, that's apart from God. And these guys forgot to give thanks. We're so blessed by Brother uh, Brickley this morning at 10 o'clock, giving praise and thanks tearfully from the soul that God delivered him a, a very good, healthy prognosis. Uh, when he thought his throat cancer had reoccurred, they gave him a clean bill of health. That wasn't cancer at all. And praise the Lord for that. But he was so thankful. So he's given God the praise online and here today he, he gave testimony at 10 o'clock. I mean, come on. Yeah. Why wouldn't you give God the glory? All good things come from him. He's the only one that can help us. He's the only hope we have. Yeah. He is the great physician and God had mercy on his health. He will have mercy on your health. And if he doesn't heal you in this life as a born again Christian, your healing will come in the next life. You will be healed. You will be made whole yeah. when you're placed in the hands of our creator God. Yeah. And so Jesus answered and said in verse 17, were, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Now, Jesus knows. He's just putting it out there for his benefit and ours. Were there not any found who returned to give God, glory to God except this foreigner? Now, Jesus isn't using this foreigner tag as a, derogatory thing. It's not hateful discrimination here. It's just Jesus didn't view the Samaritans as anything more or less than other Gentiles, uh, just a different people group. They weren't under the promises of the Jewish people uh, at this point, but he's going to the cross so all people can enjoy the promise of salvation through faith in Christ. Amen. So Jesus loves all people, but the ones that should have been most thankful right off the bat didn't come back. And he said to him, Arise, here's a bonus to his physical healing. Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, in the original Greek of the New Testament here, we're talking about the same word that is used all over 
the scriptures for saving from sin. It's the faith that led the spiritual salvation of his soul, forgiveness of his sins. And so this external blessing of being healed of this physical corruption of disease was experienced by the nine, but only one experienced that plus an internal spiritual blessing because he showed visible and vocal faith and gratitude towards God. And with God, all things are possible. And again, many people, especially even believers, only want physical blessings from the Lord. And they lose out on the true spiritual blessings that come through worship, as we experienced this morning, praising God like we heard from Richard here today and others, and thanksgiving. There's so much more, and we rob ourselves of God's blessing when we don't give him his due. He is worthy of our praise, amen? It's because God is so good to us, and we don't deserve a bit of it. Now, look at verse 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees, he's continuing on to, cro to the cross. He's trying to get into Jerusalem. When he was asked by the religious crowd, when the kingdom of God would come. Now, you got to think up to this point, if you put everything into context, they're kind of mocking Jesus at this point. They've asked him many different ways this question, and he's answered them. But they may have been asking this question with a mocking attitude, uh, concluding already that he's not the Messiah as he claimed to be. I mean, they want to stone him up to this point. They're looking for an opportunity to trip him up and to execute him. And they're going to get their wish at the cross, but that's why he was born to die. It's part of his plan. They think it's part of their plan. They think they're pleasing God, but God is going to please them in the end, whether they receive him or not. And he's going to hang on that cross and say to those that nail him to the cross, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. I'm doing this for them too. But anyway, probably got a mocking attitude here. When's the kingdom of God going to come? And he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Now, what's he talking about? Well, of course, we've been down this road where the Pharisees believe that the Messiah's the Messiah coming to set up his kingdom would be like this all at once physical geographical changes right before their very eyes in a moment. Well, that's going to happen, but it's not going to happen this time around. The first time Jesus came to call out hearts, they wanted dates and times. They were looking for him to come to overthrow Rome, to get them out of slavery and set up the kingdom for a thousand years as the Old Testament proclaims, and he will, but he wasn't going to do it the way they wanted in their time frame right here, right now. They didn't see God coming, their Messiah coming as a servant, a carpenter's son. They didn't see him coming that way. They saw him coming on the charger, the white charger with the golden crown and the robes of white righteousness. And, and that's all coming. We saw that in Revelation the second time at the second coming. But they wanted that now. And uh, Jesus is trying to explain to them, it's not going to be visible right now. It's going to come quietly right now. It's going to come invisibly right now. Without the pomp and circumstance and splendor associated with the arrival of a king in the first century. Jesus is not suggesting that the earthly kingdom, uh, as the Old Testament prophets foretold, was nullified. Not at all. He's just saying the earthly visible manifestation of the kingdom is yet to come. And we just saw it come in our Revelation study online uh, in Revelation 20. You can go back and watch that lesson at our YouTube channel. But it's not coming with observation right now. Right now, I'm calling out hearts to believe by faith in what I'm about to do. Okay, I like that song, but not right now. <laughs> Nor will they say, this is not how the kingdom's coming. Nor will they say, see here or see there. See, the false prophets were saying, oh, I'm the Messiah. Or I saw the Messiah. He's over here. Or we heard he's over in this town. No, 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 no. Lots of false messiahs then. Lots of false messiahs since then. Amen. Even in our uh, lifetime. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, what's he talking about here? 
Well, to get real clear, you're not going to be able to point to a specific location just yet, he's saying. The kingdom first comes with the calling of hearts. And that's within you, in your soul, in your person, in your midst. He's talking about himself being the Messiah. I'm in your midst, the kingdom in me. Jesus, the King of Kings, is in your midst. And I want to die on the cross to put it within your heart, the fact that I am your king, your Messiah. The king was standing in front of them. He was the one that's going to usher in the kingdom they were looking for. Yet they didn't recognize him. In fact, they rejected him to the cross and they just went their own way, kind of like the lepers did, the nine. They just went their own way to get on with life without an attitude of gratitude, without their hearts being drawn out in repentance and faith in the coming king. And so Jesus is preparing their way now by going to the cross to do that down the road, but that's their choice, it's our choice also. And so look at verse 22. Then he turns his attention from the Pharisees who were taunting him with the question of the kingdom coming. And he turns to his disciples and he says, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. In other words, uh, there's going to be some, uh, uh, something physically I've got to do. I have to be sacrificed. Your Messiah, your King, will be crucified. And you're going to long for the day that I will be here to set up the kingdom, to, res to return to set things straight. Are you longing for Jesus, I ask you today, to return and set things straight? Amen. That should be your heart. Things aren't falling apart. You may say, yes, they are. Just read the headlines. Things aren't falling apart. They're falling into place according to God's plan. Amen. And so be prepared. Be prepared. So Jesus is saying, be prepared, because I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to be crucified. I'm, taking, I'm going to be taken out of the earthly scene before the kingdom returns on this earth. And I set it up and reign for a thousand years as the Old Testament prophets had proclaimed. And you're going to wish I'd come back at a certain point. But I'm going to be here. I'm going to be in your heart. I'll never leave you or forsake you. You will not see it until that time. I will say to you, look here, look there. And they will say to you, look here, look there. Do not go after them or follow them. Don't follow the false proclamations of false messiahs or false sightings of a messiah. No, no. Jesus says, that's not how I'm going to bring the kingdom about. He says, here's how. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven. You ever seen the lightning start here and go over here and just a flat? It's, it's an awesome sight. Well, Jesus says, that's how I'm coming back everyone's going to see when I come back. There will be no mistaking he's over here, over there. Or maybe it's him, maybe it's not. No, there's going to be no doubt when he comes back that this is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So don't worry. He says, um, as lightning flashes out one part under heaven, shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. When Christ returns, no one's going to miss it. But first, he must what? There's the cross. There's the salvation. There's the penalty for my sin, your sin, the sins of all who ever lived. Jesus, the God, man, sinless one, didn't have to do it, but did it out of his mercy, grace, and love. He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So God suffers because it was the sovereign plan of God for him to die as a substitute for me and you and all sinners. And as it was in the days of Noah. Jesus said that a, another time. You know, when I return, before I return, the world will be like the days of Noah. See, the days of Noah were very wicked, very sinful days. In fact, the only people that got saved out of the first world after the Garden of Eden and some generations passed, uh, about a thousand some years later, a thousand years later, um, the world was so wicked that God sent the flood and he wiped out every soul off the face of the earth and just really started mankind over again. It was so wicked. Jesus says, that's how the world's going to be when I come back the second time. That's how it's going to be. It's going to be so wicked. It'll be like the days of Noah. And you know how many people got saved out of the days of Noah? Just Noah and his family. Eight people. 
And he preached for 120 years. And he built the ark. And everybody had all this visual to see and hear. And they still rejected the fact that God was bringing judgment upon their lives because of their sin. And we look around the sin in our world and what's being condoned uh, without getting into details, all the stuff that's even being condoned on the world stage of the Olympics. Amen. How uh, men are fighting women in the ring and all this crazy upside down sin that's accepted and applauded and rewarded with gold medals and what have you. We're there. It's as wicked as in the days of Noah. And it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man when I return with the kingdom on earth. And, but you know, all that I just said about how wicked the world will be when, when the Lord comes back, how wicked the world was in Noah's day, that's not even the point Jesus is making here. He's not emphasizing the wickedness of those days. Oh, they were wicked and they're wicked now. He's emphasizing that people are so delusional and caught up in themselves and their sin and applauding all the sin worldwide and on the world stage that they forget that they're going to be judged. They forget about God, that he, there even is a true creator God. They forget, and what do they do? They go about their lives normally. Just like the lepers, the nine lepers, they just went about their business and didn't have an attitude of gratitude. These are deluded in this day of Noah in our day today. They ate, they drank, they married wives. In other words, these are good things to do, but it's, it's a normal day. They're not giving a care to the Lord's return. They were given in marriage, there were weddings, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Boom, in a moment. It was just another day, the day before. And then he goes on, he says, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. Now we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, a lot of sexual sin, wickedness. Um, it got just as bad as the days of Noah. But that's not the emphasis here. Yes, that wickedness will be judged and was judged. But Jesus is emphasizing they went on after being warned and warned and warned. And then Lot came and warned them and that kind of fell flat because Lot was compromised but saved. But it says they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold. It's just a normal day. They planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, he was told he better get out. Judgment was coming from God. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven in a moment and destroyed them all. That phrase there repeated again. Days of Noah, destroyed them all. Normal day, destroyed them all. The day Lot left. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So we're just going along our merry way here in the 21st century. We've heard about Jesus. We've been the preaching, the, all that. Hey, we are without excuse. And in a moment, just like those planes hitting nine, on 9-11, hitting those twin towers, in a moment, the world changed forever. Just like COVID shut down the world. We woke up one morning, boom, the world shut down. In a moment, God is showing us that our lives can be changed. <coughs> Excuse me. So, even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop, they had flat roofs back then in that society. They had like little fire escape to come down. They would be up there to be cool and uh, they had plants up there. It was just part of the culture. He says, when you're on the housetop and that day comes and his goods are in the house, you have all your precious stuff in your home as we all do. Let him not come down to take them away. You better be focused. Your heart better be watching, waiting, and looking. It's not another normal day. You're not going to have time to get your earthly treasures out of here. In fact, those things are going to perish, and they're not important at all. Don't hang all your hopes on your treasures on earth, but lay up treasures on in heaven. And so he says, don't go down. Let him not come down and take them away. Get out. Judgment's coming. And likewise, the one who is, held, who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife was on the cusp of being delivered. They're running out of Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, don't look back. She longed to look back. Oh, my everything's there. Everything I loved was there. 
Everything she cherished was there. Had to get one more look at her idols and the pillar of stone judgment or of salt. And uh, remember Lot's wife. She revealed her heart towards the world, was more sold out to the world than to God. Her attachment to her things and to Sodom was so powerful, she had to look back. She was overwhelmed by the oncoming judgment, but just before reaching that place of safety, she turned back to what was dear to her. We're not to turn back to our old lifestyle those old things we used to do before we knew Christ, those old friends and the things. We, we're not to go down memory lane and reminisce with a little smile on our heart of how all the good old days, remember when. We're to put a period on the past. Don't look back and reminisce back, back in the day. You know, we use that phrase a lot. Bury the past. Move forward in newness of life in Christ. Put a period on it because Jesus did. He forgave it, forgot it. And why don't we move forward in newness of life if he's truly transformed us and not look back longingly for those sinful ways? And so remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. In other words, you sell out to Jesus here and now, that's just proof that you've sold out forevermore in heaven and received his promises that he's a God who cannot lie. And you've put all your trust in him. And I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. And one will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together in the workplace. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, the other. This isn't the rapture. This is the second coming of Jesus, okay? And they answered and said to him, where, Lord, where, where, where's the kingdom? They're still looking for the date and the time and the place and the geographical location. He said, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. And you may think, what a strange statement that he would say that. But it's not so strange if you were at our Revelation class uh, online because we just got done uh, in Revelation 19 learning about the uh, great supper of God. When Jesus comes back and judges all the nations and destroys them in a day, in a moment, that all have come against Israel at his second coming, we'll be there with him. The saints, the bride, will be there. And when that happens, all the dead, not, not one living person that rejected Jesus will enter into that kingdom. They'll all be wiped out. There'll only be believers entering in. Now, Children will be born into the kingdom over a thousand years and they will have to make a choice for Christ. So unbelievers will end up in there and have to make a choice or not for Jesus. But at the beginning, everyone's wiped out. That's not a believer. And the eagles are pictured as eating the carcasses. It's known as the great judgment feast of God, the great supper of God in Revelation 19, 21. It's very graphic. And you'll be able to see the vultures from miles away just descending upon the kings of the earth, the rich, the poor. And uh, again, I go back to the beginning. Are you kingdom ready? Do you have an attitude of gratitude? Are you watching and waiting for the Lord's return? The rapture of the church comes seven years before the second coming. How close are we? And then the millennial kingdom that we serve in for a thousand years. Knowing that, how close are we to the rapture? And again, are you rapture ready? Are you kingdom ready? Are you born again? Does your lifestyle reflect readiness for meeting the Lord yeah. and readiness to accept your government job yeah. in the kingdom of God Amen. on earth? Please stand. If you have a decision to make for Jesus today to be your Lord and Savior, to enter into the kingdom as one of the bride of Christ, today's the day of salvation. Now's the accepted time. We have altar workers that will come up here. When they see you step out, they'll step out and they'll meet with you and pray with you and show you in God's word how you too can be part of the family of Christ for sure, giving you assurance through Jesus and his word that you're born again, sins forgiven and forgotten once and for all. So step out as the music plays. And if you are just uh, have a need for prayer, you have questions, um, you just want to come and pray on your own, Feel free to kneel at the altar. There's a little space up here for you. And we appreciate, we are needy people. We've got a lot of health issues in our congregation. We appreciate your prayers. They appreciate your prayers. So today's the day to pray. And uh, whatever your need is, don't leave here without having it met in Christ. Father, we come to you thanking you for your goodness. 
Bless the time we've invested in sitting under your truth now, Lord. Help us to meditate on how close we are to your return and our attitude, Lord. Is it one of gratitude or are we just going about our every day and it's just another day? And Lord, our day can change in a moment. Our entire destiny can change in a moment if we cry out to you, Lord. And you're coming back in a moment. In a time and day we don't know, but we see the season is now. And so, Lord, prepare us to meet you and prepare us to serve you in the meantime. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Don't leave if you have a need. Stay behind. The rest of you go out there and give them Jesus. Thank you for coming today.